Good afternoon. Can you can someone confirm in the chat that they can hear me? You know how I am with technical difficulties. Hope everyone's had a nice Sunday. And um, looks like I have seven people joining me. Um, if someone could please confirm that they hear me. That would be great. No one's confirming. So let me write it in the chat. Hear me. Great. Denise says they can hear me. So I'm going to go ahead and um, maybe wait one more minute um, and then wait for people to join so we can get a critical mass before I dive into it. I have an echo. Hmm. Hold on. Okay, so I see people saying, some people saying they have an echo and some people saying they don't have an echo. Um, oh, okay, someone had two videos up, so it was a mistake on their end. So that's great because I am known for technical difficulties, so it would be no, no big shocker if something was wrong on my end. Um, but I want to thank everybody. Hey, Judy, let me say hi to everybody and then we'll get into it. Um, let me see. Hi, Katie. Um, good afternoon. I hope uh, everything's going well on your end um, and that your writing is going well. Um, hi, Mazzy. There's Judy. Hi, Liz. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Maui Swift. Uh, Judy says, just listen to the new interview of Ruth Markell today, NBC House of Mystery podcast. Yes, thank you for mentioning because I did as well. And um, it's a good podcast. And uh, let me see if someone wants to maybe put it the link in there. Um, I should have done that. But um, I have 28 people here. I've been going two, almost three minutes now. Um, let me see if I can find that um, link to promote Ruth's podcast. Uh, and that's that way people can listen to that because I, I haven't seen that um, publicized really. Uh, I'm gonna I have the link here and I'm going to put it in the chat. So if you haven't listened to this podcast, oh, thank you. Judy did it too. Thanks, Judy. Did me a solid teamwork. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, you know, obviously the first you know I've read this book. It's a great book. Um, anyone that's interested in this case. Um, that wants an insider's account, um, especially if, you know, someone who's lost a child or anyone that they've loved, I would recommend the book regardless. But um, specifically in this case, there are a lot of insights that weren't publicly known beforehand. And I won't even, you know, I'm not, I'm just sort of scratching the surface. So though, to give you highlights and hopefully to encourage you to go to Amazon um, and purchase the book, I believe that it's also available um, if you want to listen to it um, on an audio version, um, and the link to the Amazon um, is in uh, the description of this video. And uh, but I just wanted to highlight some things that is a avid case watcher, um, things that I didn't, I wasn't aware of, um, and you know provided insight on this case um, to me. And so it really is just a personal grab of things that I thought, like wow, I did not know that, or I think that's very insightful to understand the case and. Um, but again, it's still go buy the book because, um, you know, I obviously didn't catch everything and I'm only touching the sort of top five. Um, so let's go ahead and then I'll, I'll get into the um, comments later, but I'll just go ahead and get into the presentation. I do have a couple of videos that I also want to play that sort of back up, um, you know, the, the things that I'm, I'm touching on. Um, but again, you know, it's a great book. I hope everyone goes and, and buys it. Um, a lot of people ask how you can get involved or how you can, 
you know, help, uh, if the story touches you, or really, you know, spreading the word of, you know, one of the good guys or one of, you know, someone who's a victim of this homicide and supporting them and listening to them and hearing them and incorporating their words into how you look at this story, I think is how it's a little thing that you can do to help. Um, so if you can, um, you should, if, especially if you have interest. So let me see here. Start out. So again, here's the, here's where you can go get it, Amazon. Um, and I encourage you to do it. Um, all right. So the first thing is hot dogs, right? Um, you know, what, what does Ruth have to say about hot dogs and why are hot dogs um, something that I decided to highlight out of Ruth's book? So I'm going to go ahead and just read a very quick passage um, about that, and then we can talk about it. But we know very much that um, you know, anyone that's been watching this case closely knows that and has watched both the trials that the subject of kosher foods has been brought up. Um, and Wendy has been asked about that very specifically, that topic on the stand both times. And um, you might like wonder why, why it's a big deal or sort of how that could bring such tension. Um, and, you know, when Wendy and, and Dan met, they, you know, obviously they came from two different sort of religious backgrounds. But, you know, Wendy, according to her family, couldn't marry anyone that wasn't Jewish, if we know from Rob's experience and account from Over My Dead Body. And we know that Wendy and Donna, um, if accounts are right, were on J-date sort of picking um, this double Harvard grad lawyer. He looked perfect on paper um, and had to be Jewish, uh, you know, per the practice of, of Donna and Harvey and how they treated their oldest child who fell in love with someone who wasn't Jewish. They basically threatened, said her or us, um, and he made a horrible mistake and listened to his family um, and their the control over him and his life um, and, you know, hurt a lot of people um, and caused great destruction, obviously got, you know, fixed. And, you know, the older uh, brother, Robert, put his foot down. But um, it just goes to show, you know, history tends to repeat itself. And in this case, I think that that it very much did. It's just the control of this mother. Um, and anyone who's Donna's friends or thinks she's nice, you know, to everyone thought Ted Bundy was really nice, you know, that was charming. And, you know, until you see them behind closed doors and you see them when they're angry, um, you know, but I think this account is it's a small one, but I think it just strikes directly to the core of the character of Donna Adelson, you know? So if, and I think it's horrible. That's my personal opinion. I think she's a horrible person. And let me read you a little example of one of the things that drew me to that conclusion. So I'm reading here from page 41. Um, and, you know, obviously they, you know, Wendy and Dan got married, Jewish tradition, and they agreed beforehand that they would raise their children on a kosher diet. That's not something you can unwind. That's not something you can, you know, that you can change your mind. That's a serious decision. It's a serious commitment. And um, here's here's what happened. So they separated. And I guess Wendy decided she didn't want to do that or it was too difficult to follow. But that's a commitment. And um, so let's, let's see what happened. So Ruth writes here on page 41. Other situations became exacerbated. Dan had heard from the boys that Donna had been talking badly about him and that she had been feeding them bacon and shrimp. In addition, Dan heard from the daycare center that Donna told the daycare to give the boys regular hot dogs, not tofu, which made their meals unkosher at school. This was a huge offense for a grandmother to make and represented not only a lack of her respect for Dan's parental and religious preferences, but what seemed to be her desire to instigate a conflict or to drive a deeper wedge. Needless to say, oh, uh, sorry, a deeper wedge. Her goal was, to see, was seemingly accomplished. Tensions were exacerbated. Needless to say, there were numerous court documents during this period. Donna and Wendy continued to pressure Dan to allow Wendy to leave Tallahassee, ho hoping that through the courts, the children would be permitted to move back to the Miami area. Think about that for a second. Husband and wife make... They go into a, you know, into matrimony. They agree how to raise their children, right? It's settled, right? If Wendy had, you know, if he knew Wendy was going to change his mind and disrupt this, you know, and wasn't okay with that, maybe they wouldn't have gotten married, right? So it's a big deal about how to raise the children. She changed her mind, not him. And for a mother-in-law to go into a school and upsurp the wishes of one of the parents, 
the gall of that woman, truly, truly disgusting behavior. And anyone that can't see that, go look in the mirror. It's completely gross, overstepping her boundaries. So when Donna goes and picks up the boys from, you know, their private school, I hope one of the parents are listening. And I hope one of the parents look at her a little bit differently. Because think if you, if you were Dan, you know, or th think if the situation was reversed. What, what does that say about the type of human being that Donna Adelson is? It does not bode well. Okay, and let's go to number two. I didn't know this, but um, I didn't know that Ruth had spoken to Dan right before he was murdered, shot twice in the head, execution style, in his own driveway at 11 a.m. in an upscale neighborhood in Tallahassee, Florida, in, in the north side of town, which is notoriously safe and, you know, family friendly. Um, having lived in Tallahassee, I can't tell you how shocking it is that it, that it happened where it did, you know? And selfishly, if you got to think about it, that scared everyone in the community. That, sh that really scared people. They thought a murderer was on the loose. Everyone was, was terrified. Why? So that Donna could raise her grandchildren as a co-parent? So that Wendy could live her best life and date rich men in Miami? A whole community was traumatized. A murder for this family. So, okay, let me turn to, this is the last call, and this is the day that, that Dan um, was murdered. And I'm reading from, from page five here, um, but uh, Ruth was out of town. She had went to go see her, was a father figure to her, um, Lazar. And um, so she, she had flown there, so she, was, she wasn't at home. So on the day that... Um, that Dan was murdered, she was visiting somewhere else. So um, she writes, I'd flown in early to spend some extra time with him and would be staying with him and, and his caregiver, Chris, as at his apartment. Soon after I got there, Dan called my cell phone to wish Uncle Lazar a happy birthday. He loved Lazar and often kept him appraised of his latest accomplishments. Then Dan asked to speak with me again. When Lazar handed me back the phone, I noticed Dan's tone had changed. It was far more less joy joyful. He was upset with his ex-wife, Wendy, which wasn't unusual. After seven years of marriage and the birth of their two sons, they had been through a contentious divorce and had been finalized a year earlier. Her desire to relocate from Tallahassee to Miami to be closer to her family was a longstanding issue between them. Dan had considered commuting or getting a different position at one of the universities in South Florida, by, but Miami was a 10-hour drive away, and the position he was interested in wasn't available. In June 2013, Leon County Court, Circuit Court Judge Barbara Hobbs denied Wendy's petition to allow her to move the, to Miami with the boys. Wendy did not meet the burden of proof for that relocation. So... Once they had separated, it became clear that Dan and Wendy had very different parenting styles. For example, when it was Wendy's turn to have the children as a part of their shared custody agreement, Dan would ask to speak to the boys by phone at night and would often go to their daycare center and have breakfast with them. So skipping, going back to, again to the last call. Let me go. I'm looking here. I'm going to another page. She writes on page 54. I still often think of my last phone call with Dan on Friday morning in 2014, just minutes before he was shot. He was coming back from the gym. I was in Montreal. We had a normal talk as usual, covering the boys weekend plans and a bit of this and a bit of that. I often think that there was some luck of him being on the phone with somebody else, not me, when the bullet hit. If I had actually heard my son being murdered, I don't know how I could come back from that. So, I mean, that's just terrible. You know, um, he goes to the gym. If you look on the slide, that's Premier Gym. You know, um, Ruth was visiting her uncle. She wasn't even home. You know, she was putting on a, you know, a face for a very elderly relative that was a father figure to her. Dan calls kind of all happy, you know, wanting to talk, um, then talks to her, is upset about, you know, Wendy had enrolled 
their son in a school um, without telling him and kind of ambushed him uh, with the situation. So he was calling to do his due diligence, you know, as anyone would do. And um, yeah, I just did not know that right before speaking to that call that we've all heard about that actually um, she, you know, was the second to last person to speak to her son and actually had to let him go um, so that he could take that call. So anyway, that was just something new. It's just so freaking heartbreaking. Um, and yeah, she's right. I mean, imagine being on the phone while your child gets murdered and there's nothing you can do. You're not at home. You're so far away. You know, that was all very, very new to me. Um, but I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, that he let her go so that he could speak to, um, you know, that he could, he could take the, uh, take the call from the school. So anyway, that's the second thing. Third thing. So if you look here, you see about the insurance policy. And here's a little clip from the police report and the GoFundMe. I did not know about this GoFundMe. I mean, I, I think I'd heard about it just through the grapevine. Um, but it was really until Ruth's book. It was one of the things that I learned that I'm highlighting. It's a lot of things to you can learn from the book. Um, but I did not know about this. And I know that, you know, a lot of people think, you know, you know, Wendy says she doesn't care about cars or money. She drives a minivan. Um but that I've heard things to the contrary of that. Um, and, you know, so this these you know things in Ruth's book actually show a little bit of a different side um, to maybe what might be a facade. Um, and it might be actually someone who actually cares a lot about money, um, even though that the public portrayal of, you know, human rights and all of this, you know, uh, you know, I, I drive a minivan, um, the public persona may not match the true feelings. And I think that that strikes at the heart of who Wendy may be. I don't know. I don't know where. Um, but the more I read, uh, the more alarmed I am. And um, I will read a little bit from this passage about the life insurance and the GoFundMe, which was, um, the, this detail was new to me. Okay. So on page 59, uh, Ruth writes, the police knew that Wendy asked about Dan's life insurance policy just days after his death. This set off alarm bells for investigators. During Dan and Wendy's separation and divorce, there was a lot of disagreement about money. Dan had taken a large life insurance policy around 2012 during the period when he and Wendy were in marriage counseling and Wendy knew she was the beneficiary. Following the divorce, Dan changed all policies, pensions, and investments so that Benjamin and Lincoln were the sole and equal beneficiaries. He did not have a will, but most of his assets had specific destinations to the children or went to the estate. But the largest amount was the life insurance policy. Shortly after Dan's murder, Wendy was hungry to know who the beneficiaries were and kept on calling the insurance company for exact details. Wow. Wow. I thought she was grieving and terrified. Now to the GoFundMe. On page 60, Ruth writes, a GoFundMe was started by Dan's friend, Tamara Demko, to get some immediate donations. We are so supportive to Dan's family and friends for their considerations. The proceeds of the fund were later put in trust for Benjamin and Lincoln. Wendy tried to attain the GoFundMe direct donations directly, claiming to be Dan's widow, which added further grief and drama to the process. Let me read that again. Wendy had tried to attain the GoFundMe donations directly, claiming to be Dan's widow, which added further grief and drama to the process. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wendy's friends. Wendy, everyone that thinks Wendy's great, where are you? Do you ever talk to her about this? What do you think about that? Do you, do you like that behavior? Does that bode well for someone who's completely innocent and doesn't care about money? Let me show you a photo because this is what, Wendy is really good about distancing herself from any of the dirty details. And some may say on a larger scale at a 30,000 foot view, that's kind of maybe if, what she might have done with the murder of her ex-husband and father of her two, her two children who she was she, she hated. So let's play a little video and see what Wendy says about the insurance policy. 
Notice her blink rate. Notice her blink rate when she's, when she's really pressed and things get sticky for her. All right, did he have a pension? I don't know. Start from the beginning. Did you or your children benefit financially from your husband's death? <laughs> Absolutely not. Was there a, did your husband have a life insurance policy? He did have a life insurance policy. And what was the value of that policy? I don't know what the value of it was at the time. I do know that his sister is a custodian of that um, life insurance policy, and I pay taxes on that money every year, but we don't we don't receive any of it. What was the value of it at the time of your husband's death? It was a million dollars, not two million, a million for each child, two million dollars. All right, and did you believe prior to your husband's murder that you were the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? No, we were divorced, so I was the custodian while we were married. But once we were divorced, I was no longer the custodian. So you were aware that he had designated someone else to yes. do that job? You didn't inquire through your attorney about challenging the designation of the sister as the, the custodian of that money? I wasn't trying to challenge the designation, no. Blinking. Do you have access personally to that money? No. All right. What about a 401k? Did, did your ex-husband have a 401k when he died? I believe he did. All right. And are you the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? I am. That's how I pay the taxes. Oh, that's so cute. That's how she pays the taxes. All right. Did you have a pension? I don't know. Who's friends with this woman? Honestly, are you just not looking? She was asked how much the life insurance cost. She said one million. When that's that's her. That's her deflecting. That's her pushing herself from the dirty deals. Well, she should know. She was calling right after. And investigators went crazy. She was calling right after. She was in marriage counseling. She knew he took out a big life insurance policy. She knew she was the beneficiary. He's murdered. Well, guess what she's doing right away? Even though she says she's terrifying, hasn't eaten, can't leave the house. Well, then why the hell is she calling the insurance company trying to follow up if she's the beneficiary of this money? Who is this woman's friend? Well, I know her best friend is a woman named Tova Walsh who goes on the um, conference circuit and researches the importance of fatherhood on the early development of children's lives. Fathers are really important. You can't make these details up. You really can't. It is really atrocious. And that's exactly why there's books written, podcasts, TVs made. It's not, you know, Wendy wants to be the victim. And everyone who supports Wendy sees Wendy as the victim. Well, guess what? You're in for a rude awakening. You got conned. I'm impeaching her. You're right. She's lying in my opinion, and many other people's too. And this is a case of mass public interest. But don't tell me for a second that this woman, when she's asked about insurance policies, she says 1 million. Oh, are you sure about that? Oh, well, 1 million for each child. Just say 2 million. You know it's 2 million. And you are calling right after he was murdered, trying to get your hands on that money, according to this book and according to investigators. And then you tried to claim you were a widow so that you could access funds to a donation set up for your children. Calm down, Wendy. Calm down. I know you drove a minivan. And I know you wear the same dress twice to your court appearances. But there is nothing humble about you. Nothing. And when you get Botox, make sure you do your whole forehead. Because right there, that's atrocious. That's lazy. And you need to confront your plastic surgeon or dermatologist, whoever's doing that. Because they did you dirty. All right. Next point. She cares about money. If this book is to believe and these details are to be believed, she cares a lot about money. Okay, next one is about the name, the name change. Um, let me go here. So Ruth includes, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to read it. You have to buy the book to read it. But um, Ruth includes a passage about how um, how uh, Danny wrote, you know, how important it was giving this, you know, the middle name um, to his older son. Um, 
I think it's Amachai, probably I'm butchering that. But um, so it, it, and this is what, how, what Ruth writes about her experience of Wendy removing the middle, changing the boy's last name and removing them. And then much like I did with insurance policy, I'm going to play you, I'm going to read you Ruth's account, and then I'm going to play you what Wendy said on the stand when she was asked about it under oath, a lawyer. Here we go. And so she, she, this passage about, um, you know, why this name is so important, but she, she writes, the memory of Dan's deep intent in the naming of his children, the meanings he placed and the connections to the past he cared so much about preserving and honoring was always a huge solace to those of us who mourned his death. His ex-wife's choice to change the last name and remove Benjamin's middle name felt inexcusable and heartless, another loss to mourn. I have no idea how deleting someone's middle name helps keep them safe from harm. And she didn't explain. With Danny out of the picture, Wendy acted as though she was finally free to make choices that children were unfettered by his preferences. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at the time, I felt I had to accept these very painful actions because I did not want to be cut off from the boys, particularly as it was becoming clear that our former daughter-in-law and her family were taking steps to diminish the boys' memory of their father, including by removing his name from their own. It felt important forever for Phil, Shelley, and me to remain a presence in their lives. Um, Another thing that, um, you know, I'm trying to find the, I think I might be getting a little lost here, but another thing that, you know, without reading it, because um, I don't want to just read the book, but she informs, you know, Ruth's account says that Wendy informs them in an email that she had changed their names, um, you know, right before, you know, here, here I, I guess I just will read it because I don't know how I can summarize this. Um, she wrote, in September 2015, Wendy heard us deeply and this is on page 73. Um, Wendy heard us deeply by emailing me to tell us matter of factly that she had changed the boy's last name from Markel to Adelson the prior July for safety's sake, she said. The timing of her discourse was no coincidence. We were scheduled to visit the boys the next day. The boys had recently started school and their drawings already featured their new name, such as, the, such as one we would see hung on the wall, Lincoln Adelson. This was unbelievably disingenuous. There was no safety issue for the boys that could relate to their last name, but the hurt would not be the last. The perception of her deceit was compounded when we discovered that she had decided to remove Benjamin's middle name, Amachai, chosen in honor of my mother. Changing their last names was also particularly hurtful to Phil, whose only son had kept his family alive through his American grandsons. I mean, who are Wendy's friends? <laughs> who who look at this woman and think, oh, I want I want my my friends. I want to I want her in our parent circle. I want her in my book club. You know, this is heartless. This is if this is to believe, this is sociopathic. Um, this is no empathy. This is Jeffrey Class is to be believed in his words of you know the family has no empathy. She emailed, she changed their names, and then but she only told. Ruth that until she had to by email the day before she was going to and upsetting her tremendously right before she was about to see her grandsons, which she didn't get to see that often. I mean, it is just really, I mean, gosh, look at her. Look at her. Look, she dropped. Why drop the middle name? And she says it's an honor to both families because someone in her family, um, you know, first uh, name was a guy and his name was Aaron and it started with an A. Okay. I mean, what is wrong with her? And I love how everyone's like, she's never going to be arrested. Well, if she's never going to be arrested, at least acknowledge her behavior. Okay? That's all I ask. Let's watch her on the stand now. Have their names changed. And does your mom have any issues with having access to your boys, or does she have full access to your kids? I mean, there's no issues with access. How often would you say your mom sees the kids? I think it depends on the week, but... Probably at least once or twice a week. What? How old are your boys now? They're 11 and 12. How old were they when their dad was killed? It was 10 days before my older son's birthday, so he was almost five. 
and my younger son was uh, three and a half. Did you change their legal names about a month or so after the murder? No, not a month or so after the murder. No. When was it, Dutch? Even sooner than that? Oh, absolutely not. Um, when I tried to put my children in school, and their faces had been unblurred on CNN and all across social media. I'm not sorry I to interrupt really you, did. but if you'll answer my question, my question is, when were the boys' names changed? The boys' names were changed after I wrote a letter to Danny's family explaining Lie, why I was changing their names. When were their names About changed? a year after. Okay, and that was when they were legally changed, July 6, 2015? I don't remember the date, but if you have it, that sounds correct. Okay, so... They were legally changed on that day, but just a month or so after the murder, when you were enrolling them in school, is when they effectively had their names changed. That is not true. And what did you change their names from and to? I changed their last name from their father's last name to Mike. From Markel to Adelson. That is correct. And did you also drop the middle name of one of your boys that was a tribute to his paternal side? It was a tribute to both families. Did so you drop it? I did. I lost an honor to both families that day, yes. Okay. So Wendy's account is that she only changed the names after she had wrote a letter to the Markells explaining them why, right? That's what she said. Let's go back. Let's find that spot. It definitely, by her account, her account makes her sound a lot better, right? Makes her sound actually honorable. Let's listen. Social media. I'm not sorry I to interrupt really you, did. but if you'll answer my question, my question is, when were the boys' names changed? The boys' names were changed after I wrote a letter to Danny's family explaining why I was changing their names. Was it she did not change the boys' names after she wrote a letter explaining why she changed the names. That's a lie. She's a liar if you believe Ruth Markell. And I honestly, I believe Ruth Markell a lot more than I believe whoever this person pretending that she is. Ruth Markell's account is, in September 2015, Wendy hurt us deeply by emailing me to tell us matter-of-factly that she had changed the boys' last name from Markell to Adelson the prior July for safety's sake, as she said. But what does Wendy say? One more time, because I think people really need to see it. No, not a month or so after the murder. No. When was it, Dutch? Even sooner than that? No, oh, absolutely not. Um, when I tried to put my children in school and their faces had been unblurred on CNN and all across social media. I'm not sorry I to interrupt really you, did. but if you'll answer my question, my question is, when were the boys' names changed? The boys' names were changed after I wrote a letter to Danny's family explaining why I was changing their name. No, she didn't. Ruth said it was matter-of-factly, and it was in September 2015, and she said that she had changed it in July. When he's lying, what, what is perjury anymore? Is perjury a real thing? Can people actually be held accountable for perjury, especially if you're a lawyer? Please answer me this. If so, what, what are we even doing this for? Why have a justice system? Why do we just only hold certain things accountable or is a rule a rule? Is a law a law? Is a liar a liar? I know people think she's cute, but I mean, come on. How much are you gonna take? All right. Should we go to the next one? Well, look at that cutie. Look at her. She's so worried, she's so cute. Totally truthful, you know. She did nothing to help the investigation. Um, that she's been nothing but helpful. Yeah, she hung up on Craig Isom, you know, one day after the memorial service when he had some follow up. Who's her friend? Who are her friends? And I want to go back because I just saw something in the chat that Judy brought up. Um, wow, there's a lot. I might have lost it. But anyway, um, it's about how. Oh, here we go. Mentor lawyer, Judy says, mentor lawyer said he heard from a source who said that the older son ran out of the room crying or screaming when he was at school and was told his last name was Adelson. 
I can say that this person has also contacted me and shared the same account um, and has shared that Wendy was going around saying that she was, did it for their safety um, and that, you know, the boys were having a hard time. And I, I've also heard other things, but I can never, I can't share them at this time, but um, it really upset the boys that she changed their names and she knows there was no threat to them. Look at her. So at least it's comforting to know that one person's disgusted and actually talking and being an honorable person and doesn't like what they see. You know, it, 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 it gives me some hope um, because I know she's very accepted and Miami really still supports her and she goes about her life and goes to parties and still sits on boards and holds memberships and has a leadership position in a thriving company. But um, it makes it really does make me feel better to at least know that one person is noticing and is disgusted and doesn't accept this behavior and thinks it's pretty gross. At least we've got, you know, one person, at least one person telling me that. Next one. Um, I did not know that, you know, Ruth had informed Wendy or was talking to Wendy um, about Sigfredo's arrest. So I'm just going to read that little detail from the book. Ruth writes on page 77. On May 25th, 2016, I received a phone call from Craig, Craig Isom, at midnight to say that they had, be, had been gathering serious evidence and several important developments had occurred. They had picked up Sigfredo Garcia, the very first public person publicly named by law enforcement to be involved in Dan's murder. I called Wendy in the morning to give her a heads up and that there would be a press conference later that day, possibly about an arrest. She proceeded to call me back several times, almost frantically, to get as many details as possible. I was in constant contact with Craig and was advised by him not to have any more communications with Wendy that day. It would be one of the last times I ever had an extended conversation with her. In retrospect, calling Wendy to give her a heads up was a result of my desire to maintain a working relationship with her for the sake of the two boys. I was trusting and cared deeply for the safety of the children. So, you know, you can say what you want about Ruth. You can say what you want about Wendy. You can assess people's characters however you want. You can believe whoever you want, have as many opinions as you want. Um, what I see is, you know, till the very last minute that she could, Ruth kept an open mind and an open heart about dealing with Wendy out of respect of what was best for her grandsons and having a relationship with them. And I still see that. Um, several years have passed and it just, you know, I didn't know that that shocked me, you know, that, uh, up until that very last minute until the arrest, you know, there was, there was collaboration or an effort to collaborate, um, which is obviously gone now. So those are my five points. I do have another little, just a tidbit. It's not a main point, but, um, it's something that made me extremely angry um, and I just wanted to share it with you because it's upsetting, you know, and I think it is such a small little moment, but I can put myself there and I can just see the evil. I can, I can feel the evil of this moment. So let me take you to that moment. And again, this is a book that's, you know, I'm looking here. It's like almost 200 pages long. It is, you know, it's, it's a long so th these are just tidbits. So I really do encourage you to go read, read all of it because I'm really just picking out the things that stuck out to me personally and bothered me. Um, so let me see here. So this is the part that got me actually pretty angry. Um, so Ruth writes, while all of the estate issues were happening, I wanted to con continue seeing Benjamin and Lincoln. I visited Benjamin Lincoln every few months with my Canadian grandchildren. In October 2014, I decided to take a pre-planned trip with Shelley and her family from Toronto to Florida to visit Wendy and the boys. It was my 70th birthday present to myself. We stayed in Orlando and drove to meet Wendy and my grandsons at the Butterfly Conservatory in South Florida. When Wendy showed up, it was not just with the kids, but she also had Donna Harvey and other friends. I realized that since Dan's death, she still hasn't been alone with me. Hmm, wonder why. 
Benjamin and Lincoln were very happy and excited as they looked at the amazing tropical insects and watched butterflies hatch. I then noticed that the Adelsons would not leave me alone with the children for even a minute, hovering very closely at all times. Even when Benjamin gave me my first long hugs, hug since his father's death, the Adelsons were standing nearby monitoring the encounter. At one point during this outing, Donna came up to me when I was sitting alone and said, who would have done such a thing in broad daylight? I was already sad while watching the children. I did not want to talk about the murder. Can you believe that? Who would do such a thing in broad daylight? Donna says to Ruth shortly after the murder. She, I mean, I think at this point, anyone that's friends or supporters of the Adelsons, they're living in an alternate reality, in my opinion. This is just cruel. It's horrible. This just not should be accepted in a polite society. And I just don't know how they look the other way and, and see through the, you know, see charming, happy, nice people. I mean, yeah, if you just only want to have surface level relationships. But, um, you know, those are those are the things, you know, those are the five things and a little angry tidbit. Um, and that's really sort of the end of my commentary and analysis. Um, and I, I just want to, you know, go through one thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Someone's talking about Dear Zachary, um, the movie. Um, so I just want to think one more, as we move into um, as we move into this next trial with Charlie, whenever it may happen, and everything we know about Charlie, his behavior, his illegal activities, the sex tourism, the you know, not respecting their patients' w wishes on what medications they wanted to avoid for whatever known reason, he just blows by that and wants to change their medical charts. Um, we heard that on the wiretaps, um, talking about sexual tourism with underage girls in front of Wendy, who also is, you know, the facade says she cares a lot about um, exploitation and, um, you know, uh, you know, human trafficking um, to, you know, you know, the drugs and steroids, um, you know, that's just scratching the surface. We, we all know that this, this, whatever she but Wendy made a choice to say on the stand that since her 20s, she's kind of not been close with the older brother, who's a respectable doctor. Um, and by all accounts, if you listen to the Over My Dead Body podcast, it's a genuinely comes across as a genuinely honest guy trying to do the right thing and, you know, doesn't won't accept horrible behavior just for the sense that he can have a family when that probably would have made his life a lot easier. But she says that she was closest to this brother, Charlie, in her 20s. If you're close to somebody and they're your family member, you know who they are, right? You get an understanding of their moral character, the choices they make. The, you know, the curtain's, you know, the curtain's not up with your own family, especially one that's as close. And Wendy projects is as close as she is with Charlie. We saw them talk on the morning of the murder for 20 minutes about just random life things, according to her, about whether to fix the TV or not fix the TV, whether to let Danny take the boys swimming. Um, so they're close, right? So you can't, it's be hard to believe that she didn't know about who this guy really was. The guy that we can hear when he thinks no one's listening. The guy that she truly knows who her brother really is. So as we approach this trial and hear about all these horrible things about Charlie, you got to remember, she testified to having a good relationship with him and a close relationship with him. She testified in his, that he did well in his classes when we know that he almost didn't, you know, graduate from, um, you know, his uh, perio uh, school because he didn't do all his work and kind of slacked off and everybody looked over their shoulder. And if you can believe that what's in from that source and the police report as drafted by Craig Isom, someone called and said, he was basically not doing anything. He was confronted. He tried to scare, you know, weasel his way out by claiming sexual harassment. And it was Harvey that got his friend, a local judge, to use his influence to get Charlie passed through with a degree. That does not sound like someone who did well in their classes. Does it? If that's to be believed. 
So where, where, how many lies does it take? How many distancing herself? How much misconstruing before people really start maybe seeing the picture a little more completely? Um, you know, and as we get go through here, through this trial, I just hope people keep in between Ruth's book, between Jeffrey Lacoste, the interrogation tapes, um, and everything that we know, just the, the facts and circumstantial evidence. I really hope people start opening their eyes. And I know that, you know, Stephen Epstein has objective facts and, you know, he even himself, which is funny. If you look in that interview with Surviving the Survivor, he is asked by Joel, and you can go back and watch this, you know, about this life insurance and, you know, what the two million, what did he make of it? And, and Stephen Epstein dismissed it saying like, oh, they had enough money. It wasn't a big deal. Money was a big deal. Wendy was calling right after. So I really just do not know. I mean, I, I literally could, I could, I could make down a list. Um, I haven't read the book, but the things that this guy was saying about Jeffrey Lacoste, about Wendy, um, you know, and I just did a video, um, Knives Out, where I show something he's just completely misconstruing you know, uh, the facts at hand by saying that he said the first thing that Jeffrey Lacoste said when he sat down, the detective, like literally two days when he's still a suspect and like freaking out and not thinking, like piecing it all together was that, you know, I'm an awkward, he knows it's over. And he was saying, he was trying to break up with one. He was like, look, if it's over, it's over. But she would tell him what he wants. You know, it was just, you don't want to believe that you had all these month, good months with somebody and they showed you the perfect person. And then you keep wanting that person to come back. Right. So I think that uh, Epstein, when he said, he, he quoted, and I put it in Knives Out, it's on tape, when he said the first thing that Jeffrey Lacoste said when he sat down with the investigator, Hale, was that there's a very good chance that Wendy and I are going to get back together, so I'm hesitant to talk. That is not what he said. He's half joking. He said there's a 1%. So anyone who, you know, wants to come at me about Steve Epstein, come at me because I'm freaking prepared. I'll make a list. But that is him just misconstruing. You could do the tattered shirt. I don't know what color glasses. Were they Wendy glasses he was looking through? But that is him really misinterpreting the truth. And he's done it several places. So he, if Jeff, if Stephen Epstein, if you believe him and think his book is great and, you know, think he has objective facts that can't be denied, he said that money wasn't important when he was asked about that life insurance and it was not a big deal and certainly wasn't a motive. Well, then answer me this, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Objective Facts. Why in the hell did investigators think it was curious she was calling, following up, trying to get her hands on that money to figure out who the beneficiary was right after his murder? How are you looking at this objectively? And the end. Now we get to the fun part, which is everybody's comments. Okay. I'm going to might have to go. People get mad at me at this end of commentary, commentary thing. Okay. It's a lot of comments. I don't know how I'm going to catch up. Okay, but I'm going to try. Everybody's saying hello. Katie, I just finished Ruth's books yesterday. Judy says, it was surprising they asked her to recount his murder. But Ruth Markell held it together. Hey, y'all from Raleigh. Are you friends with Stephen Epstein? Judy's friends with him. Liz, listening to the book on Audible, it's amazing. Only disappointment is that Ruth doesn't narrate, but that must be a genuine reason there. Yeah, I mean, they, they get professionals to do that. Um, hi, Judy. I can't believe they asked Ruth that. Seems a little insensitive to me. Judy says, yes, maybe it would be too emotionally stressful for her to read the whole thing. Yeah. And also, I think it's, I mean, Judy, you know, people, you, I think you have, I like, I like your voice. It's grown on me. I think it's, you know, it's as if I'm hearing, you know, someone who's familiar to me in that way, but you hear people drop off, you know, negative stuff. I mean, you know, she's an older woman and this is not her profession. And, you know, to have her like read all of that, you know, people are awful. So it's better just to get a professional. 
Katie, oh yes, the hot dogs. God, Donna is awful. Yeah, that's not her place. That's truly, I mean, that says, it's a small thing, but it, it speaks loudly that she would absurd one of the parents wishes and go to the daycare and try to get them to not to listen to, you know, something they know is, I mean, how, what kind of position does that put the daycare in? That just shows you that Donna just does not care. It's a very, very selfish and greedy woman. Very controlling, in my opinion. They are, there is Donna and her kid. Yeah. And you heard her when she's on the wiretap with Charlie talking about renting an apartment. She says, I have two little boys. I can't take this apart. Imagine security to, deposit that I have because I've got two little boys. They she they're her property. Uh G says, yes, I agree. I wonder if they ran that question by her in advance. Otherwise seems really incentive to ask her how the murder happened. Okay. Did he say, does Robert have any contact with his family at all? From my understanding, no. Or is Rob yeah, he's completely estranged. Liz says, agree, Fancy. Donna is a sociopath like her children. You know, I can't diagnose them. I can only know from Jeffrey Lacoste's tapes and his very informed, and we took a step back and really looked at it objectively with his expertise. I believe what he says about that whole family lacking complete empathy and being very weird and very enmeshed. And every, every little tidbit, every little thing has backed up what he said about that. Prada. Robert is estranged from all the, the immediate Allisons, Donna, Harvey, Wendy, and Charlie. That is correct. Katie, Donna intervening with daycare. She's so terrible and needs to be prosecuted. I think that they, they want to slam dunk, but I think they could take, I think they could, with the right, with the right um, approach, I think that they can, could, could, could convict her on what they have now. Absolutely. Poor people are done, or they do that to people with no money every day, with less evidence. There's your public self and private self and secret self, Maui Swift says. Yes. Judy says, got to know your future in-laws before getting married. <laughs> exactly. But then, you know, you don't really see people until like, um, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, it's Abe Lincoln, but, or Churchill or somebody like that. Like, you know, if you want to test a man's character, like, um, you know, see him under pressure or something like that. But um, all their lives, you know, narcissists, sociopaths, those types of people, they want to seem normal and they read, they can't have real feelings or emotions on their own. So they basically study people and mimic them and they get really good at it. And they're not going to drop that facade to you until they absolutely have to, or they get caught, you know, or they get confronted, um, which, you know, if it's to believe what Danny said or was saying, or by Wendy's account, is he told her, everyone thinks you're a nice person, a good person, but I'm the only one who really, kind of really knows what you are. And, you know, and everything I've seen since this murder and, and Wendy and her family, if they did this, they drew the attention upon themselves by doing it, kind of backs that up. You know, and prove me wrong. I mean, Wendy, your lawyers, you know, anyone that's close with Wendy or their friends that may see this, Prove me wrong. Come show me how how great they are, um, and to negate all this evidence, you know, speak up. I mean, I'll listen to you. Well, I'll listen to you. Donna assumed she could just take control, and that made Dan the cut of criteria to marry. Yeah, I mean, I think Donna and Wendy thought that Wendy was going to be Miss Harvard, and this is another. Gosh, please go buy the book, but. Um, there's a bit in there of like where Dan goes to Ruth before the the wedding ceremony and asks Ruth and the family not to mention that he went to Harvard because it makes Wendy feel insecure. And that there are a lot of toasts for Wendy, but not very many for Dan at the wedding. And you would have to read her passage about that because it's chilling. Katie says, I did not know that either, that she had just spoken with him before his final conversation with his teacher friend. Yeah. Imagine if that teacher did not call back then. She would have been on the phone with him when he died. How do you, like she's like she wrote, how do you get over that? Denise, Robert was the smart one. He knew his family was truly malicious and toxic and got out of Dodge. 
I can totally relate as if I had to do the same thing with one side of my family, way too toxic. Yeah. I mean, imagine that you have a brother, sister, mom, and dad, and you know, you get away from him, you move away. Um, there's all the problems that they caused for him. And he finally kind of got around and had a, a working good relationship with them. But um, imagine you come home, your sister's husband and the father of you know, your nephews was murdered at 11 a.m. for no reason at all, an upstanding person, no vices, except the fact that he was really hated by your family. And you knew that because they talked about it all the time. And then when you want to talk about it, they won't talk to you about it. They refuse to talk to you. They refuse, you know, you heard him. He, he tried to talk to Wendy. She's like, well, he had a lot of enemies. And then she was telling him that Rob only cared about, he wanted to talk about the murder, not about you know, how this affects her. I mean, it just, hello. <laughs> hello, everybody. What? Put it together. I mean, imagine that. They don't, they won't talk about, I mean, that, he's suspicious. That's very suspicious. Judy says, they were so selfish and insane. Yes. Liz says, yeah, it's so upsetting to hear Ruth had spoken to Daniel literally minutes before. Yeah, I did not know that. Angel says, reading excerpts from Ruth's book is a good idea. I have my book and I'm following along. Katie, the utter lack of insight of the effect that this would have on the boys, the height of malignant narcissism. Yeah. Um, I think maybe when all this comes out, we get a little more closer to the Adelson's trials. It's really a shame that Katie was able to, um, you know, through delays and her lawyers, able to really extend and the mistrial and that juror. Um, this has caused so many years of delays and sort of the waiting game. And it just shows how the, you know, and there was COVID um, to be fair, but um, now we're finally getting to the masterminds, right? To the, their trials or Charlie's trials coming up. Um, and it's really, it's about where these times where these boys can kind of understand or starting to get on the internet. Um, I've also heard from people that uh, it is their best guess from where they're situated that the boys do not know. They're, they've been shielded pretty pretty good from this, um, all the media attention. And I, I actually, am, I'm glad about that. You know, um, I don't want things to be hard for them. Um, but that's going to change very soon. And uh We'll see. Wendy lit the fuse and turned the whole family against Dan. Got to skip some of these. Some I will never finish them. Um, uh, Maui says, "So glad she got to speak to him." Yeah, and I'm so glad that that their call got interrupted. Um, so it didn't. So Ruth didn't have to call from Canada. Like, what if Ruth got disconnected and she just didn't? put things together as quickly um, as, or didn't hear as much as the teacher had and didn't actually call for an, you know, an ambulance like the teacher did. I mean, imagine living with that. Imagine getting disconnected from somebody, you know, it happens, you know, um, with my own mother who um, lives in a place where she gets spotty connection. And I always worry about her um, like driving off a road um, or something happened or getting, you know, I just worry. And, um, you know, I always so I always call back to make sure that nothing happened. Imagine if Ruth was in a situation where she didn't call back or didn't do anything, and then she found out what had happened, which is very plausible. Denise, such selfish people to rob the kids of their own father makes my heart hurt for them. Oh, I just remember something I was going to say. Um, there are certain friends I heard of Wendy's who have known her a very long time. And it was conveyed to me through the grapevine, so maybe once or twice removed, maybe three times removed, that of all the things, they stopped, a lot of people stopped talking to Wendy and company after the, I think it was Dateline or 2020, whenever the first special came out. And it was just so obvious. I mean, Dateline and ABC, they don't produce murder mysteries that the common person can't figure out. Like an average, you know, intelligent person. I mean, that goes out to, mainstream media. I mean, that's, that's not HBO. That's not some super cerebral, cerebral, you know, thing. That's, that's prime time. They do not cover murder mysteries that cannot be solved by just sort of common on its face. 
So when some of Wendy's friends with good consciences and smart brains, and I guess weren't so enamored with her um, or under some sort of a spell, they saw that they got it right away what happened, especially if they knew the real Wendy and they knew how unhappy she was and kind of knew her ways. A lot of people did cut her off. And I heard through someone that the thing that was most upsetting to maybe someone that knew her really well for a long time is the psychological damage that they brought on to those two innocent boys by doing this. Now, Tova, Tova Dr. Tova Walsh, um, who studies fatherhood and gets grants from the U.S. government to, to talk about how important a father is on the development and um, welfare and emotional welfare on, on kids, they do not see that. But some did, and that's comforting to know. And I'm only bringing up Toba Walsh just because she went on that 2020 and said that, you know, Dan, she thought Dan was emotionally abusive and, you know, maybe she got involved in their divorce a little bit and you could see her name in court documents. Um, I don't know. But, um, you know, she did go out and lend her reputation, name and face and words and insights and opinions to this matter. And I'm just commenting on that, given what she does and where she stands on this situation. Um, I can't believe Wendy testified there was a 1 million policy on Dan, but when pressed by Kaplan, it was 1 million per child. Yeah, that 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 is very suspect, right? She's distancing herself. She was calling days, if you can believe, you know, what Ruth writes in her book and it made investigators very suspicious how quickly she was calling to follow up on that beneficiary. And she knew he had taken out such a huge life insurance because they were in marriage counseling when he did it. And she knew she was the beneficiary. So she was calling up real fast to figure out what was going on there. And it's because she knew about it. So much in this book showing just how horrendous Wendy is. Yeah. Behind the scenes. I mean, she's shiny and well, not here, but, uh, you know, I guess, you know, everyone comments on how beautiful she is and how smart she is and, you know, um, what good character she may have and how she doesn't, you know, but scratch the surface. Cause there's other place, there's other places you can go to look to find where that's not true. And one of them being Ruth's book. Yes. Didn't he say emission is lying? Katie says, yep, she was trying to collect almost immediately. Plus, Dan's retirement account, savings account, and the GoFundMe is particularly horrendous, Denise. Judy, she wanted every single penny. Money was important to her. I wonder if Donna also tried calling on her behalf. Maybe. What's interesting is there's so much we don't know because the prosecution uh, state's not going to show us anything that they don't have to. So they're just they're probably just sitting on stuff. And I did a video about it. But even in the deleted communications, when they handed to Wendy, Wendy was really if you, if you really look closely at her. I know Stephen Epstein wasn't, but I did a video kind of highlighting how nervous she was and how much she couldn't take her eyes off that. And, you know, the other side said that hasn't been admitted to evidence. And they objected. So that tells me that this is new. And that's Georgia getting a second bite at Wendy and showing, we got more on you. We got more on you that you haven't seen. Go back and watch my video. It's called, I don't delete my messages. And that's when Wendy said, oh, you know, I do, after my calendar, I use it as a to-do list. Um, that was some of her best work, by the way. Like she deletes all of her calendar appointments. And then she deleted a message from Charlie on that morning saying, that is so sweet. So that's what she was being called on. Patty, the old saying, don't be worth more dead than alive. Yeah. Judy, so try you very. Oh, yeah. She called herself his widow, Katie says. Yep. Denise says, Wendy claims she didn't benefit from any of the money because it was for funeral expenses. How much was a funeral? No, she um, it was specifically about the funeral expenses. That was when Georgia was asking about his checking account and that there was $15,000 in there. And Wendy said, I didn't see any. We didn't see any of that. And Georgia said, you didn't. And Wendy said, and she said, where did it go? And Wendy said, or the boy, it didn't go to her and the boys. And Georgia said, well, where did it go? And she said, I don't know, funeral expenses, which is what a weird thing to say. 
that tells me, and you can see that when she gets a bad reaction from Georgia, she's surprised by it. And that for me tells me that's someone who doesn't, isn't working with the same level, maybe mimicking things and her mimicking something. There's a real moment there. We can see she knows that her answer wasn't good and is trying to, I can see her brain almost going like, oh, yeah. who answers that? Funeral expenses? It's almost like a pleasure out of it. Y'all want to watch it? I do. Is it this one? I think it's this one. 401k. Did, did your ex-husband have a 401k when he died? I believe he did. All right. And are you the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? I am. That's how I pay the taxes. Oh, maybe I didn't do funeral expenses. So you were aware. Sorry. Um, it's another video. I was getting confused. But anyway, funeral expenses. Why would you say that? That's cold. That's cold blooded. And I think that was the title of one of the datelines, cold blooded. Hmm. SM says, I cannot believe that evil woman tried to get a GoFundMe. Yeah. Settle down, Wendy. Settle down. No one's trying to, you know, money was set up for the boys and it was set up by one of your friends that you were in good standing with. So just calm down, okay? And I think I had like 50 to 60 grand in there. Yep, her selfishness and her arrogance, Patty. Yeah, I don't know why Miami's, you know, beach can't see it, community, and all the boards she sits on. But that is what I see when I see, you know, when I see her on the datelines, when I see her on the 2020s, when I see her in these two trials that have hundreds and thousands of views, you know, when I listen to the podcast she went on and is now up in the public domain, um, her book that she, you know, was read widely across the FSU campus and is still in circulation. Um, those are the things I'm commenting on. And th that's where I'm sort of deciphering the behavior in addition to the people that I may speak with or hear from behind the scenes. Yep, that's what we did. Um, this does puzzle me a bit. I mean, her family are gazillionaires. Why on earth would she go with a GoFundMe? Um, I don't know, Liz, why Why are Donna and Charlie debating how much potato salad's worth and whether to get it or not? It's just a few dollars. Or, you know, why is Donna trying to go use Charlie's suitcase and trying to make a big issue about it and do all these special trips instead of just going to... Um, TJ Maxx and spending whatever 60 bucks on a, a suitcase instead of going through all that hysteria and coordination. I just think that this is the way they are. I hate that dumb wide eyed look. Yeah, I mean, look, I spent a lot of time in the South and I'm not just talking about Florida, but um, one of the things that, you know, and I was a cheerleader and I was, you know, up all up in that and um, in a certain society where, you know, in the South, everything with certain people is extremely fake and extremely phony, you know, where they'll say one thing to your face, you know, the bless your heart, you know, that kind of sentiment. Um, and, you know, where they'll say one thing behind to your face, like, oh, you're so sweet. I love that dress. And they turn around and say something awful. And I just, I, I've seen that. I've been a part of it and I've been around it. And, um, you know, so I, you know, I get it. Um, so I recognize it when I see it. I don't know. It's, you know, women's intuition is a real thing. It really is. And um, I just see it here with her. And I guess that's one of the things that kind of, um, and that's my opinion. Um, but I guess it's just one of those things that I find uh, incredibly, uh, and again, it's not a science. I can't prove it, but I, I see what I see. And uh, that dumb wide-eyed look. It's, it's, I, I see what I see. I noticed that swallow with an absolutely not. Yeah, when asked if her or her children benefited off the murder financially. They absolutely did. They absolutely did. What are we talking about here? Denise, Wendy is evil, if not more than others, because you know she was trashing Dan to her family, getting them all riled up and to take some kind of action even if she did, even didn't explicitly ask them. Sorry if I have to skip some of these. Now I swear, very convincing on the service. Yeah, and again, 
I got a lot of, you know, blowback and everybody thinks, oh, Stephen Epstein's getting attacked by the cult, you know, whatever. I had a genuine, honest reaction to what I saw as someone completely mistelling, misreading the Jeffrey Lacoste account, the Jeffrey Lacoste tapes, and I pointed out specific instances that back up why I feel like that. So it's not just conjecture. Like, I really do believe that. And, um, you know, uh, I... You know, you know, you know, Matt Shear, who did the Over My Dead Body Body podcast, came out after the fact and spoke about his experience and said that he, when he watched that interrogation video with Wendy, he said there was no way in his mind that she was not being genuine. Again, it's just that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, but if you look two or three times at that and you kind of read Ruth's book or come up, you know. Again, I could kind of tell almost right away, um, I don't know, my life experience, whatever, my brain, I could tell that and I have reason, you know, I, it was, I was pulling in so much info. Um, he's allowed to have his opinion, but again, take it all in, you know. Um, I know some people just can't read other people. It can be really smart. There can be someone who's so smart about certain things, really book smart, you know, can be critical thinking in other ways, but you just cannot read people. They're bad with people, right? I've worked with people like this who are geniuses or really smart or really good um, expertise, but they cannot read people. I mean, you could look at things, you know, watch, um, you know, Sheldon from whatever that TV series is where they're all like astrophysicists. You know, it happens. And I guess that's why I got so upset because I heard that and saw it. I knew that this guy, Stephen Epstein, was going out and going to be like an authority on the matter. And I just saw his read so wrong, which is it's his right to do. It's his right to go out and sort of profit and tell his story. But I just, given everything we know, it just, it just it sucked, you know? I believe he did, Katie says. She's a dang custodian. You know he did. No. SM, what a miserable, evil woman. Oh, poor her. She has to pay taxes. Disgusting. Yeah, I mean, it's the victim mentality right there. So she goes, okay, I'm benefiting, but we pay taxes off that. Like, do you see how she turns it? That's that's just someone who's, that's a manipulator. That's, that was a manipulation tactic, in my opinion. Because she is a liar, Maui Swift says. LJ says, Judy, in my opinion, wide-eyed look is all part of the passive aggressive. Wacko. Katie says, it's astounding anyone believes this liar. Patty, the deer look. It's just like when Vin Vinny Peloton called, yelled, come on, Wendy. Yeah. I agree, Judy. It's so creepy, Maui Swift. Denise says, Judy, same. I cannot stand Wendy's doe-eyed stare, parted lips. Like, she's so perplexed why she's even there. I seriously can't stand to look at her. Yeah. What are these taxes she claims to pay out? I think it's just taxes on the um, taxes on the money that she's making. That the, the, the money is making money, the interest. Um, I don't know. I'm not a accountant, but. Oh, I love petting on the Botox. Yeah, I get Botox, but I get good Botox and I don't only do 80%. I do the whole 100% of the problem area. I don't I don't do 80% like Wendy does where all her little lines sit at the top. Nothing against Botox, just, you know, we know you got the money, Wendy. Can you go to someone good? He'll do the whole thing. LJ, love the Ted Bundy analogy, spot on, yeah. People still to this day, I mean, he got married and, you know, had a baby. It's just the charm. Some people are just, have got no street smarts, just are not good with people and are completely um, susceptible to being deceived openly like they want to be. Botox on point in this pic, yeah. Forehead, Wolverine, fancy cracks me up, Liz, yeah. The Wolverine beard, rush bomb, fierce. Fancy. Do you mean the Botox you got resulted in the carrot top eyebrows? Bad Botox job. Um, I don't know. I know her. Um, 
Okay. And I'm doing this. Look. Oh, if you want to. Look. One else. Yeah, that job. Look at her. Look at her eyebrow. And look how. Look at the space in between her eyebrow and her eyelashes. Right. I wish I could find where she's smiling. Let me see if I can find where she's smiling. She smiles a lot on the stand, so it wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't be hard for me to find her smile. Oh. Yeah, look at those lines, just perma perma lines sitting up there. Come on, Wendy, we know you giggled the whole time you're on that stage. Let me try this one. When were their names? About anyway, I don't know if I'll get there. I want her like a full smile. But anyway, about a year after. Look at look at how much space is in between her the top of her eye her eyelid, top of her eyebrow, and her eyelashes. Okay, now look here. Again, do whatever makes you feel good. Now look at this. Let me see. Is that the best one? Maybe that's the best one. Do you see that? Looks different to me. Anyway. She practiced that look on her face in the mirror. You can tell, MM says. This photo is reminiscent of Donna's high school pic. Angela, haha, cutting corners on the Botox. Patty says, that name change, can you believe that? Who does that? She can't afford better, but yeah, just pay for 10 extra little units and have them go all the way to the top so you don't have that weird, you know, how am I supposed to concentrate on that what was you're when you got perma, perma lines up like that? So so obvious anyway the name change issue is one of the most brazen tells i'm no lawyer um even i know you answer with a word yes or no not shake your fuzzy little head wonder and not one of them said dan was anything but an excellent father Yep. How do you say you love your kids yet go along with this plan to destroy their world? Yeah, I mean, they're forever have got like a shadow hanging over them. And Wendy too. Every little supermarket she walks in and goes about her day and acts like she doesn't have a care in the world. There's probably somebody looking and think, oh my gosh, there's that woman who murdered her kid's father with those poor kids. Should we say something? And one of these days someone is if they haven't already. I mean, Dateline in 2020 don't produce murder mysteries that the average person with the average intellect can't put together on their own. What, what were they thinking? What were, did the greed, just the greediness and the need for control just overtake what was best for those kids? I think it did. Liz, Wendy's callousness is so stark. Strike a dagger in Ruth's heart and then twist it. Yeah. And then, you know, going up to Ruth, you know, shortly on her 70th birthday, when she's there celebrating, not giving her any time alone with the kids and walking up to her and saying, who would do this in broad daylight? In retrospect, what kind of, that's, that's sociopathic, in my opinion. The truth isn't any truth within her or her family's despicable. And then her friends are so other sociopaths, birds of a feather. No, they pick, usually pick empaths. They pick people who um, are so really just take on other people's emotions and, um, you know, sort of feel instead of think. That's what they like. And people that kind of treat them like they're, that coddle them. Tova Walsh needs to be sent a copy of Ruth's book so that she can see it in black and white. I don't think she'll read it. She's very devoted to Wendy, both in public, going in the media, and behind the scenes, defending Wendy. MM says, bottom line, who paid for the bullets? Katie, she came prepped with a story. Agree, a vile woman bred from a vile family. Yeah, and how, how rare is it, and how luck, you know, how telling is it 
that there is one person who wasn't involved in any of this and isn't implicated in any of this completely shunned the rest of his family. And then when we heard from him, Robert, he seemed like really genuine, like a really great, honest person that only wanted to clear his own name as much as he could. Half his name, Robert, can't really clear the Adelson name and try to come out and be on the right side of things. I mean, that was incredibly brave. And that's very telling about the rest of that family. LJ, unfathomable. How can we continue to learn more and more of this unending deviant behavior involved here? Just wait till we get to the trial. You can't erase the past. It still stands to be memorialized. See you next Tuesday. Apologies, but there's no other word. That's right, Liz. And if you in, in England, they throw that around. So, you know, it doesn't even bother me when people say it. Happy camper. Wendy told a friend, other friend that Ben, the older boy, cried and ran out of class when she learned that his last name had been changed. Yeah, it was on the first day of school, I heard. And um, Wendy was going around explaining that to other parents. SM, that's so heartbreaking about the child running out of the room crying. Those children would go to hate Wendy, Don, and Uncle Charlie and Harvey. I don't know. I don't know if they will. They may grow up to be just like them, and that's extremely sad. The fact that they've denied any kind of access to the outside world, to Ruth, the other family, is very telling and doesn't bode well for, you know, it, brainwashing is a real thing. <laughs> any behavioral fans, behavioral panel fans, she has the believe me expression. Yeah, I'm a big, big behavioral panel fan. And I noticed that um, one of the things I noticed when they're there um, in one of their analysis, one of their videos, and I probably should go back and find it and do a side by side because I think it'd be pretty funny is that like just like I did with the punishment question which you can find on my Patreon so but anyway they have something they, they team mercy hands and so when everybody whenever somebody's you know essentially guilty or trying to deflect what they'll do is they'll throw up their hands and their palms up and it's almost like create a barrier and to like to come across like you know um, like believe me um, but it's very guilty deceptive behavior um, it's called mercy hands. That's what they turned it like, have mercy on me. You know, um, I'm guilty. Um, but one of the things that she does, if you think about it, you watch that interrogation when Craig Isom says, do you know anybody would do this? What does she do? She throws up those hands and says, who would do this? Answers with a question with mercy hands. So that's something I learned from the behavioral panel. Again, it's an art, not a science. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I noticed. This is all commentary. Unfortunately, I did not videotape this murder, so I can't prove any of it. Yeah, someone's agreeing that Wendy's a see you next Tuesday. I'm going to skip through a lot of people saying that Wendy's, this is horrible and they're horrible. Katie says, imagine Ruth having to sit there and listen to that. Yeah, who would do this in the broad daylight. Well, maybe it was you, Donna. Maybe you killed my son. And the only reason and I know that, and you know, my father figure knew that the minute he, I had to tell him about it. And um, maybe I have to sit here alone and can't see, spend any real time with the only thing that can remind me of my son, because you killed him, but I have to sit here and take this from you. No one holds anyone accountable these days for much. Yeah, Patty. Well, not Miami. Happy camper. It's not like she doesn't even try to come up with a plausible explanation for the name changes. She lies all the time and people believe it. So she doesn't need to try and make it lie believable. Observation station. I don't think cute nor pretty. So right. LJ, in my opinion, the boys will take back the Markel name when they become adults and process everything. I don't know. OJ's kids believe him. You've seen all the evidence come out about that. Judy says, yes, there was no threat because the reason and identity of the murders were known to her. Yeah. Patty, they've been so indoctrinated by this family for years. Yeah, that's the sad part. Katie, they will mature in ways and look into this. I hope so. Pamcakes, that's emotional abuse. Their daddy was murdered and she rips away the only thing they have left of him, Pamcakes. LJ, how could you not process everything? How would, would you have to be a complete moron? 
Yes, she informed Wendy. That was bombshell for me. Yeah, Ruth informed Wendy. There's also something else, and I will do another video, and I was going to do a little one of my Patreon videos because I've committed myself to be doing these for a while. There's some communication and evidence between Wendy and somebody that is, I noticed right away and that I will be speaking about, but it's around the time of the arrest and Wendy not knowing and pretending not to know. Um, I found very interesting. Katie, who would suddenly show all kinds of interest in communicating? Patty says, anyone with half a brain can see what's going on. I don't know. It would shock you how many people still support Wendy. It really would. It's, I guess, it's, maybe it's one of the things that keeps me energized in a weird way. But it, um, that family, I've heard, is living, especially Wendy, is living life, you know, basking in, you know, good things. I don't know what her daily life's like, but I, I only hear that she does not seem affected by this at all. SM, I can't believe, can't imagine how traumatized the boys must have been when their favorite uncle Charlie was arrested. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Wendy still had their the is really big, and a lot of family came in and friends came in. had a had a big um, bar mitzvah still, even after he was arrested. But she and she invited. The Markels too. You know, I think because she knew she was going to have to come up on trial and be asked about it, so she had to open communication, just like she had before the last trial. But as you know, Ruth writes in her book that, that it was just passing messages, pre-recorded messages. There was no real communication offered. But when Wendy got asked on the stand, she, it gave her an out, saying, "We've been in contact about that," and then nothing more. So it's all it's all theater. It's all um, her just doing PR. Um, and again, I don't know what Tova Walsh, her, her best friend, who really is all about keeping families connected and about the importance of, you know, strong family relations. Um, maybe she just really thought uh, Danny was such a monster by all of Wendy's accounts. That maybe she accepts this. I don't know and that she's cool with it. She's cool with murder. I don't know. But um, if she's a smart person and looks at everything, you know, and then, you know, I just I, I just don't get it. Um, I, do, I don't know how someone who studies how important a father male figure is in the development of raising children and goes out on a conference circuit talking about the research on the matter is best friends with someone who possibly killed along with their nuclear family, a good, by all accounts, a good dedicated father, despite how much tension there was between the families or how nasty he was. He was a good father, right? He was going to help those boys. He was going to give them every opportunity he could. He was going to, he loved them. And yet she still supports Wendy privately and publicly, as far as I know, and, and is willing to go out in the media, um, given what she does to show her face and support Wendy. Really just, again, it's what makes this story so rich um, and so intoxicating to so many people is details like that. Um, adult means unable to think clearly confused. I call this family the Adelsons. Ooh, Adel, Adel. How do people become so evil? Where does it come from? I don't know. Okay, we're getting close to an hour and 30 minutes, so I'm going to end it. I'm going to have to speed through some of these. Shoshana says, I saw an interview of Ruth and she comes off as genuine and honest. Yes. As compared to Wendy on the stand. One million dollars. One million dollars? You oh, one million dollars for each child. So two million dollars. Yeah. Judy, poor Ruth, having to play along with these manipulative behaviors just in order to be able to have access to her grandchildren. I agree, Judy. And it's, you know, on top of that, it's the little things too. Like Hearing the first person to write a book about it say that based on objective facts that they don't believe that Wendy had anything to do with this, given what you read in Ruth's book and the behavior um, and all the things that do implicate Wendy, that Ruth has to eat that and that she didn't release her book on Dan's 50th birthday, but this guy did. And meanwhile, it's supposed to be very victim friendly and all about Dan and his character, which maybe it is, but yet puts the bullet hole at the center of the book of his cover. It's very insensitive if you want to think about it. just don't promote it and release the book on his birthday and make it all about the victim and then you know do something like that. I just think it's in very poor taste. 
Also know that Stephen Epstein's book has a lot more reviews, um, positive reviews than Ruth's book does. And that's very upsetting. Oh, I love, I would have loved seeing Wendy's face during the Ruth call about Garcia. Yes. And again, I have some communications that are pretty funny too about that day with Wendy, people talking to Wendy about their us and the way she reacted. And pardon Fury too. Kixney Sugar. She also committed perjury when she said the judge sanctioned Dan. There are no records of any sanctions against him. I'm tired of the state of Florida not protecting us citizens from these criminals. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Perjury by a lawyer on a high profile case goes un unaddressed, which that tells me maybe I should do that. Maybe if I, when I serve on a jury, which I hope to, I'm not going to worry if people lie or perjure themselves because I know I've learned from this case that it's it's not worth prosecuting. So I'm just not going to take that. I'm not going to consider a perjury a real thing. I'm a juror. Is that is that how I should look at it? Lawyers listening. If anyone saw the film Dear Zachary, first of all, Dear Zachary will take your heart, smash it against the wall. You know, it, that is the most heartbreaking documentary I've ever seen. I still like think about that. Truly brutal. Lisa, so sad. Those kids being denied love of such a decent woman and grandmother. Yeah. Patty says the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree in that family. Her time will come, Judy says. Denise, Donna could see Ruth having fun with children, and she said that you make Ruth go back to the horrible July day to crush her spirit and bring her down evil you know what yeah she didn't want to talk about the murder she just wanted to see her son and those kids katie there is one huge thing for me in the book how wendy's house was so prepped for the moving day then very next day yes yes it was I mean, I could do a list of 15 things. I'm glad other people are bringing it up. And I still hope people go to Amazon and get this book and leave a review. It should have more reviews than Stephen Epstein, who I think is sensationalizing and misconstruing a lot of things, both in his interviews and within that book. Sorry. I have an opinion. Not a lawyer, but I'm still smart. Not all lawyers are smart. Some of them just got a law degree, which they kind of give out a lot. All in two dime for Patty. Um, fancy, believe me, most people here in Miami who are aware of the case do not support Wendy. There just needs to be more exposure. She sits on boards. She's still sitting on boards. She's at a leadership. She's a chief of staff and head of diversity and inclusion um, and head of legal operations for a, a startup, which I won't say the name, but a lot of people should know. So she, I mean, imagine going in to Wendy's office and reporting to her and having to take direction from her and watching the dateline. There's going to be a dateline coming out in this fall, but it flies. It's truly astounding. She walked into, after she went to the trial and perjured herself, she walked into the mayor of Miami's office for, I think it was like Casito talk. You can go look it up. You know, I've, I've posted about it and tweeted about it. I mean, it's public. You see her in the video. So after that trial and after all that, perjury and after she was grilled and looked horrible she's thrived she's walking into the mayor of miami's office with her employer no problems so you know i hear you kicks but um that's not what i'm seeing i don't know what's going on down there patience i suspect georgia has many plans ahead for all of people lj i hope so well uh, I'm left wing and a Democrat. Am I a hypocrite? Is that, is that logic work where I'm a hypocrite now? I don't know what one has to do with the other. Um, poor Markel is waiting and waiting, Patty. We need more people like Robert in this world. I agree, Liz. It's like, again, this is such a horrible, you all the horrible behavior and potentially people of really bad behavior, bad character. Um, and it's so rare to see it in a family. Um, but uh, 
it what it is so refreshing between Ruth and Robert and, and Jeff Lacoste that you really see people that are just, you know, you can see people that were raised right and have a real strong moral compass and they're still persevering um, despite all of this awfulness. Sorry, I'm gonna have to skip some things. I need, do need to end. It's been an hour and a half. Um, observation station says, Winder is evil. Who steals the kids, takes the furniture from an unsuspecting husband, leaving divorce papers on the bed? No warning was, um, and Dan was in shock. Yeah. It just, you know, if you're going to leave somebody, sit them down, have a talk with them. You know, I know he was, you know, had a strong personality, but he loved her, you know, and he, you know, even tried to get her back for a year. It's not like it's going to hit her or do anything. It's just so you know, and she was planning all of this for a really long time. And, um, you know, I heard from somewhere that it was Dan's 40th birthday coming up and she'd already had been, you know, well, in terms of timing, had been making plans um, with Donna in particular, knowing she was leaving and knowing she was and laying down the groundwork. But meanwhile, she emailed all of Dan's friends asking for like really, you know, kind of um, funny stories or embarrassing stories about, you know, Danny or hum I don't know, I don't know what it was phrased, but doing that kind of stuff at the same time, which is just, it's devious. Like she didn't have to do that. Just don't go so crazy and plan. Like it just, it takes a certain kind of person to do all that. And I'm, I'm just, like the way she left him was pretty, again, but I don't, I don't want to get into someone else's relationship, but um, I'm just what, I, what I'm going off of. Okay. Um, Denise also need to investigate if Wendy was trying to schedule childcare and school down in South Florida before the murder shows that she had advanced knowledge. Yeah, I think, um, Wendy's very smart. That's the reason why I, th I don't think she's, why she's so safe is because she didn't get involved in the calls because she knew she's like the first person they would look at. She said that several times in her interrogation. I understand why I'd be looked at as I'm the ex-wife. Um, but, uh, you know, she didn't, she didn't communicate. She kind of, She's a lawyer. They should, you know, she pre-planned this if that's to, you know, the state's theory is to be believed. Um, they all did. I mean, it wasn't just one mind planning this. It was three minds and, or maybe four with Harvey, um, which I think there were four, which is why I think Harvey is in all the demonstratives of the family chart. But um, whether it can be brought to justice or got, did any overt acts, I don't know. But, you know, I just don't think they're going to slip up like that. I think if you're going to get them, it's not going to be because it's some detail they didn't think about. Maybe, but that's a pretty one. I, you know, if I were planning a murder, I would not enroll my kids or inquire about rolling my kids moving away, especially with the schools and arts and sciences thing going on. She's probably thinking, oh, well, let me make plans to look like I'm wanting to stay here. I don't think she would do both, but, you know, she's going to try to arrange the board. So it looks, everything looks good in her favor. That's what I would do. Not that I would do this, but if I were to think like that or try to think like that. In my opinion, his background reveals he is prima facially unqualified to write a decision, but no investigative background. I mean, he's not, he's a divorce lawyer in North Carolina. I believes Wendy had nothing to do with it or had no pre-knowledge of it. Um, was Wendy trying to line up employment in South Florida before the murder? Where are the police on these things? Yeah, I mean, FBI is involved. So I don't think us internet sleuths aren't, um, you know, maybe sometimes that's how things get solved. But um, I think uh, there was a, this is gonna go two hours. There was a man named, um, and we learned this from Jeff Lacoste tapes. There was a man named Gary Cohen, who I think was friends with Harvey, um, but was very much in their social circle and had offered Wendy during the divorce or right shortly after. And this was part of the motion to relocate, um, very much like, and, and Jeff said, treat, Wendy was like a father treated like, because a very close relationship and he was very, I don't know. It, I, I think it was sort of like an Elizabeth Holmes situation, got very involved trying to help Wendy and offered her something that either was or was to become shortly after some sort of part and track. I don't know, something, um, a position as an attorney and his, I think, sued drug companies, um, medical malpractice, I don't know, like a $1 million job. 
that both her and Donna were extremely um, obsessed with. And that could only be taken if she were in Miami. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe this person, Gary Cohen, got involved in the, um, the divorce a little bit by saying I've offered Wendy this job and got his name tied in all of this, which is unfortunate for him. I don't know. Maybe when men, Wendy got back down after the murder, um, maybe Wendy expected to get that job again and was surprised when um, other people working at that law firm did not want that or did not think that was a good idea. I don't know the judgment on this Gary Cohen guy who is a lawyer and um, very wealthy. And I don't know if he still supports the Adelsons, but I did know that um, there was a $1 million offer for Wendy through her family friends um, for a job in Miami that was used as a part of a compelling reason why to let Wendy move, relocate to Miami for her career. Nope. All right, I'm gonna speed through these because I gotta go, it's hard to talk this long. I'm sorry. Try to get people I haven't read. Lucy, I feel like an attorney waiting for justice to be kind, why the, is the black widow free? why her whole family criminal families tree we all know the truth yeah because it's what we know and all the circumstantial evidence and if you have a lot of money you can put prosecutors in the state in a position where they know they can't take a swing at you unless they have a guaranteed shot because they only have one one punch and they got to make sure they land that blow it's you know the criminal justice system, I mean, it's, it's highly influenced by money. Highly. Poor people tend to go to jail, right? Rich people tend to go free. Cases, the Harvard thing was just plain weird, yeah. I wonder if Wendy went around telling people that she got into Harvard but didn't actually, or Yale or things. Or I wonder if Wendy went around and said that she got into top tier colleges but didn't take them didn't didn't go for some reason and, I, and I, I wonder wonder stories like that will come out and lies will get exposed i don't know by the way wendy's law school ranking is nothing to write home about yeah which is probably why she may or may not have told people she got into more to yale and to harvard but didn't go for some bs reason i don't know Katie, the great, oh, let me read Judy's first. Um, I think that's the response to Judy. Judy, I doubt Katie will do anything to help at this point. The greatest mystery of this whole thing, why Katie, Katie never squealed on any of them. Lucy, the crime doesn't hurt only his family, but the entire community. I followed this case from the beginning. Yep, extremely selfish. So that Wendy could live her best life in Miami carefree without having to deal with someone that you know, wanted to co-parent. Katie, a voice, for, uh, a voice for the victim seemed like Charlie Adelson promised her an easy life, life on easy street. A cellmate said Katie bragged about how she was going to be so rich after getting out of jail. Yeah. And that her kids would go, you know, have private tutors and Amy Manka, which is also the reason why, because Baya Harrison, or I think represented, Amy Manka or her appeal or something like that. And by her and um by Harrison is sort of the court appointed free for Sigfredo person handling his uh appeals. And he's trying to get by a he's trying to get a new trial based on the fact that Baya once you know worked with or represented Amy Manka, even though it didn't fly. But it just goes to show. Where do the boys think that Charlie disappeared to? I don't know. Wendy and her support system are doing a good job, I think, keeping the boys insulated from all of this. Where do the boys think Charlie disappeared to? Yep. It's so funny because I said this on another live stream, but like if I were to make a movie, like a, a fiction out of this, like maybe like HBO or Apple TV is doing, um, I would definitely write a scene in there where it'd be very dark, but funny, where Wendy goes in and she's like tucking in her, her bed, her boys to bed at night, you know, with like maybe a little nightlight on, um, or the little glow stars on the ceiling. 
and she pulls him up and they say, mommy, you know, where's uncle Charlie? He's been gone for a while. Um, I, you know, overheard that he's, you know, is in jail. What's he in jail for? And she turns to the, one of the boys and says, based on the advice of my attorney, John Lauro, I can't talk to you about that. Just like I can't talk to, I haven't talked about this murder um, or testified that I can't talk about this murder based on the advice of my counsel, the murder of your dad and my ex-husband, who I hated. Um, I can't talk about his murder or the fact that your uncle was arrested, my brother, um, because my counsel said I couldn't. So just like I expected the court and the jury and the public at large to believe that, I expect you to believe that too. I just can't talk about it. I'm a witness in this case. And then she turns out the little knight and says, good night, boys. Sweet dreams. I think the kids must know. Kids are mean. Someone must have told them. I heard from a source in that circle with kids. Actually, two people have alluded this to me. That the kids that are... I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Um that they don't know because maybe people that are friends with Wendy or have kids that are friends with Wendy's kids aren't aware of the murder and, you know, that would maybe give them the assumption that Wendy's boys aren't aware of the murder. If that makes sense. Dan was very mean to Wendy. He wanted equal parenting rights. Yeah. But again, you know, I'm just trying to be honest here, you know, about my own. I have friends that are 50-50 with um, narcissistic men, and I believe them. <laughs> but um, based on, I think that maybe was the account that Wendy gives, and maybe because, you know, Dan was smart and direct, and, you know, sometimes people say that about me, um, but... You know, I think that's the story she saw. But if you look at Wendy's behaviors, we're learning from Ruth's book, from, um, you know, Jeff Lacoste tapes, the people that were close to her and dealt with her who saw another side. Um, it really makes you think, well, maybe Dan was an, had narcissistic, you know, traits because he was so smart and everything came easy to him. And he maybe couldn't, you know, didn't have patience or compassion for people because he just didn't know their brains didn't couldn't do what his did. Uh, many autistic people have that same uh, stigma as well. But then you got to look at, well, then based on the behavior that we know about Wendy, what does that say? What is Wendy? What is, what is Donna? Um, what is Charlie? I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say that there's something very seriously, I don't know what the diagnosis, but um, sociopathic comes to mind. Just hearing the tapes and if he, if he did do this um, with Katie, who is guilty uh, and will die at Lowell Prison. Do the kids question who killed their father? What does Winnie tell them? Yep, I think there's one over there. What's up, Kim? Dan's boys will suffer from this unfortunate. Yeah. If they did commit this murder, the Adelsons, they destroyed all their lives out of their own greed. I wonder if any of the kids are uh, just allowed to go to their house once the parents discover who she is. I have not heard that. People think that Wendy's, a, there's a lot of people, even lawyers think that Wendy's a victim and all this still. I mean, Steve Epstein. Um, Carol, probably the Philippines, they could easily lie to the kids and say their dear uncle went to establish a dental clinic or something. Yeah, I wonder if they're lying or telling them the truth. She discarded Dan's baby blankets that Ruth gave the boys hideous. Yeah, I, saw, I agree with you there, Katie. I heard Denise JPJ says, I heard Denise Williams' daughter is still brainwashed to believe Mike's mother, Cheryl, is crazy. Yeah. Babs, the boys will soon change their last name again. What a disgrace to be called an Allison. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, OJ's kids still believe in his innocence, OJ and Nicole, they, they don't think that um, OJ killed their mom, despite the DNA. Jen, 100 
K hit job to receive millions in benefits. It's just a good business decision. Capitalism 101. Yeah. On paper, it makes sense if you don't have any, you know, um, morals. Marsha, Wendy told lots of untruths on the stand while all the time looking at all robot sweet at the jury. Grr. If I was Wendy's kid, I'd be scared for my life. Imagine living with a sociopath. Yeah, but she doesn't show that. Okay, I'm going to have to flag because I have got to go. This is um, almost two hours. Jeez. There's Michael Palmer. She raided all the bank accounts. Dana was taking her back to court for the fraud. She lied to the court, and she didn't declare all stolen assets in the settlement. Donna was worried about this situation. Happy camper. In her police interview, she consults her calendar often to give the detective information. Her entries were not deleted. Patty, I hope the boys decide to search the truth beside truth themselves. They'll get in touch with Dan's family and Uncle Robert. Yep. I actually had a friend um, who had a brother, a friend of mine from New Jersey. Uh, it's actually a very good friend of mine. And um, and he he had a, a sports, he had an injury in sports. And um, so then he got, you know, he got hurt and then he got addicted to painkillers. And then... Um, he met a girl and they had two kids and th the girl was extremely wealthy. And so there's a lot of money in this situation as well. Um, but they obviously became drug addicts or, you know, and they kind of, I think they may have even met at AA, but they, you know, had a couple kids and then they got divorced and then she moved out of state with the kids and the brother allowed it to happen, but still very much trying to be a father, had to have his own problems too. Um, but then um, her brother had been sober for a long time and then, you know, had um, it was sucks because I actually worked with her and she was out on maternity leave for her first baby. And um, he died like like right before she had her baby um, and he had overdosed. I guess he relapsed. And at the time he was living with her parents and her dad was a doctor and they found him dead in their home. And it just, you know, all sorts of you know trauma. Um, but the thing is, is that woman that he was married to would not allow a relationship with my friend's parents. So they lost their grandchildren. And so they couldn't do anything. But when those kids got to be older, because my friend's kids, you know, now are older and several years have passed. But when they got to be teenagers, they reached out directly and established a relationship um, despite their mother. Um, and so that, that's a bit heartwarming. And even actually what happened was, is that, um, so my friend got remarried and I went to New Jersey and, um, like a couple years ago and talked to her parents and I talked to them about this. And, um, they were, they said that the, the son had, the grandson had actually come to live with them for a while. And so reconnect and it was just quite, you know, quite beautiful. So it does happen. Uh, fancy. I have a question, says Katie. Um, I watched People Investigate's episode yesterday, and there is a woman being questioned by police, throwing suspicion at the Adelsons who I've never seen before. Can you tell me more? I just haven't watched it in a long time. Could it be Tamara? Because she gave a police interview saying Harvey acted weird. And obviously, from what we know from the GoFundMe, she started it. So I'm assuming GoFundMe probably contacted her, but I'm not sure. You could probably find out, but LJ being on board means you are donating big bucks. It means nothing else. People buy this way to boards for PR reasons. Yeah, I think it's the Miami Foundation, which is also kind of shady. There was this big investigative report that I read about how um, the Miami's prosecutor's office actually lets guilty, rich, guilty people like give money, and then they the prosecutor's office donates it to the charities they want or something. Um, it's been a while since I read it, but it was kind of shady as hell. It was a Miami thing. Fancy. Is it true that Dan was trying to get Wendy disbarred for fraud for raiding their, all their joint accounts? That's what I heard from other websites and it scared the hat of me. Yeah. If you are a Patreon member, um, when I go through the initial police report, I dive into that very specifically. Um, 
about that and specifically the accounts in the police report when they're interviewed by Craig Isom, both Dan's girlfriend at the time and then the Greenbergs. So they had a lot to say on, about that. It is true. And um, also another lawyer friend of Danny's said that it very much she could get disbarred for um, what he was alleging. But I think he just was the only way he could fight back. You know, the, the, look what Donna was doing with the like they were doing everything they could to um, mess with this guy, you know. All right. Sorry, I got to go. I really do. I'm skipping through a lot. I'll try to get someone maybe I haven't gotten. Um, I would give her the OJ treatment if I saw her in public. What's the OJ treatment? So funny because um, when I lived in Tallahassee, um, my mom had a friend or a coworker or someone she knew who was taking her child to the dorms um, or like moving their kid into the dorms. And, uh, you know, the dorm mate had a, I forgot whether it was, I think it was the son, um, but I don't remember if it's the father's son, but basically they were introduced to their, they're all moving, the parent, it was parents day and they're all moving their kids into the FSU dorms. And um, the person who, introduced themselves as the parent that my, my mom's friend said he looked familiar and it was OJ. I didn't know that OJ's kid went to FSU, but apparently so. But what do you do in that situation? Hi, I'm OJ. Our kids are roommates. Just a funny little anecdote. <sighs> Robert is out of the will. Yeah, that's why he needs to write his book so that he can make up for all of that dough he's not gonna get now. That's his will. When did, Marsha says, when did Ruth know it was the Adelsons? Did she spec them all along? I haven't read her book. Um, she doesn't really go into what she does, but when she conveys, she's visiting her father figure, which I think is her, her uncle, because um, her father died when she was younger. But um, she did convey that immediately when she told him that she was visiting that what had happened, that the immediate reaction from the uncle was the in-laws and said that in Yiddish. So I would only have to assume that's kind of where her mind might've gone to. I mean, it was the bit, you know, that's where everyone thought. And it was so funny. I'm telling a lot of personal anecdotes, but I was doing a, um, for whatever reason, I got a piece of, work that I was doing um, in Tallahassee um, business-wise. And I was working with someone who is kind of on the, kind of runs in those circles, those, you know, prominent Tallahassee circles is, you know, who I was, my, my point of contact was. And I was talking about this, this was in 2016. So I was talking about this um, murder. And this person said that they were on vacation, the husband and wife, that she was on vacation with another couple who also knew them. Um, and this person, you know, was Jewish and said that um, they were on vacation. And then when they had heard about it, they were all together. And all of them immediately thought it was Wendy and her family. So I think a lot of people thought that. And then if you press in Scott on Surviving the Survivor, who is in Tallahassee, is a radio host, very, you know, very popular, said that, that immediately um, when he's talking about... Um, like springtime Tallahassee or something, you know, that that's what everyone was talking. Everyone thought it was them. Brooklyn. Um, I'm surprised no one points out that the boys are mostly being raised by Donna. I mean, in my opinion, those calls she posted. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And I like said too, she, she's even like just casually talking to Charlie about renting a new apartment and talking about how she, she's never going to get a reasonable down deposit because she has two little boys. It's just so tell. It's a small thing, but it's a very obvious thing you can point to in this convoluted case of just how she feels about those kids that are hers. And she has them so much they affect what could potentially be a down a deposit on her any kind of thing she rents. That's just she's a grandma that babysits time to time, right? No. And and Wendy in her podcast, the one she went on the writers whatever radio, um. She says that she considers her mom after more, more of a co-parent and how grateful she is to her. 
sorry, I'm getting really tired. I'm going to have to end this. Um, Angela, Toba suspends her belief because she and Wendy were besties in college at Brandeis. If her bestie is a murder her, that dissolves her whole college experience. <laughs> yes. So much manipulation of others. I read somewhere that Robert called his mom a very evil person. I think that quote was dangerous person. And then, but then he went on the over my dead body podcast and said he never said that. I mean, she sure tried to throw a wrecking ball into his life. And obviously um, I can isomize that he thinks that she did this. So he probably does think she's evil. Imagine having those feelings about your own mom. I know a lot of people aren't blessed to have a great mom. I do. But um, I have a lot of, you know, friends that did not have a good mom. And that's, that's, I just can't imagine. Sarah, even after Charlie's arrest, the Adelsons still have a decent support. Oh, yeah. I mean, she had the bar mitzvah, you know, shortly after Charlie was arrested. And a ton of family and friends descended on Miami. I heard it was like over 100 people. After Charlie's, like days after Charlie's arrest. Okay. Angela, if Wendy doesn't read, watch, or listen, then why is she having John Lohr or her lawyer intimidate and threaten every YouTuber covering this case? Yep. Looking forward to the new dateline. Yep, coming out this fall. I wish Over My Body would do a second season on this. I don't know. Matt Shear said that he thinks that Wendy's interrogation was innocent. I, I mean, maybe if Matt Shear did it with an intelligent woman, um, I think it could benefit greatly. Katie, I wonder if her entire dating relationship with the cost was calculated to set him up for, for this. I don't know. My just guess would be that it was probably started out very genuine. And the minute, like in June and stuff, when this stuff started looking like it was going to happen, and Dan filed that thing on Valentine's Day, kind of threatening to disbar her and, you know, take away, you know, super only supervised visits with Donna. And then when Jeff kind of like called her out in bad behavior, I think she switched. Wendy's not a Democrat. Their internal views are very right wing. Well, also to, um, you know, Donna, you know, Justice for Dan put out how Donna, um, you know, donates money to end like assault rifles, you know, and you know, public supports like very you know, pro gun legislation. Meanwhile, her son's got a stash of guns of assault rifles. So I just think that they're hypocrites. Um, and then I someone sent this to me that John Laura, Wendy's lawyer, is now a lawyer for Trump's lawyer who goes on like New, the woman lawyer who goes and says those outrageous things. And this isn't a political statement. He just, you know, there's something like on Newsmax and stuff all the time. So, um, you know, uh, if they are really, Demo you know, Democrats, they sure do align themselves with people that go the other way or issues that go the other way. Maybe, you know, it's maybe it's hypocritical. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Sorry, I'm just really, um, wow, there's so many comments. Let me start from the bottom. All right, everyone, have a good day. Let me see. Uh, let's send this one. <laughs> Fancy, I love your insults. Thank you. Um, Wendy is also says the media is mean for accusing her family, the prosecutor. Yeah, we're mean. Yeah, because the prosecutor just casually flings accusations against alleged co-conspirators just to be mean, being sarcastic here. Love that, Judy. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, wow, two hours. Join my Patreon because I'm going to be doing a deep dive into Samantha Magbanawa. Um, tomorrow night, similar to this, if you're interested, Patreon, fancy fiction. Um, all right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.